want to have Karis come forward. Karis is, is getting ready to leave us again. We're not nice enough to her while she's here, I guess. No, God has a great calling on her, and, and I want to allow her just a, a little bit. Karis, could you tell us where you're going to be going and what the Lord has you doing? Yes. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed my time being back with you guys. I missed you a lot. Um, so I'm leaving tomorrow, and I have an opportunity to go back to YWAM Tyler, where I've been, and serve for the month of July with a program um, that it's like a missions program for teenagers. So if they're interested in missions, they want to learn more about God, more about evangelism, it's a program with that. And so I will be there for the month of July, and I have, I'll be taking 11 teenagers on a two-week trip to Guatemala. So the first two weeks, I'll be training and working with them and hanging out with them, discipleship stuff, and then two weeks in Guatemala. And so if y'all would be praying for that, and I'll be back in August. I'll see y'all then. But please be praying for the trip and for these kids to just get a heart for missions and uh, gain more knowledge about the Lord. So, yeah. And have you, have, do you, yeah, give, give a hand cap. That's okay. <laughs> Have you raised, do you need support for this? Have you raised that support? Is, is, is it okay to say support? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, so I have raised my support for this trip. Um, yeah, for this trip, but in the fall, I will actually be going on staff officially with YWAM, with the organization I've been working with. Yeah, very exciting. So for that, I'm... Working on fundraising still, I'll need to be fully supported with ministry partners and everything like that. So when I come back in August, I'd love to talk to you about that, but July, I'm out. (laughs) Yeah, so thank you guys for your prayers, and so many of you guys have already supported me, and I really appreciate it so much, so. Absolutely, and if if you don't if you don't know who Karis is, Karis is the 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 daughter of our our youth pastors, our our children's pastors. Excuse me, Derek and Tanya, and they've been going to this church longer than I have. And uh, we, it's so awesome to see what the Lord's doing in your life and and how He's calling you. I want to ask Karis if, if you'll step down to the to the front with me, and if we could have. Um, her parents and and of course our our deacons, elders, leaders, close family, uh, in, as many people. I mean, if you want to, that's the best way you could support her is is through prayer and through leading her through through covering her in prayer as, as she goes into these countries and delivers the gospel. So, Father, we just come before you right now, God, and we lift up cares to you. We, we thank you for the calling that you've put on her life and for her obedience to that calling, the desire to take other youth to the ends of the earth to share the precious gift of your holy word, God. We just declare that blessing be upon her, Lord, that your angels surround her, As she travels, Lord, that you keep her safe, Lord. We pray peace for for Derek and Tanya as their their daughter travels um, here in Texas and and overseas, God. And and we just, we, we know, Lord, that you will provide for her physically and spiritually, God. And I pray, Lord, that everyone she encounters, whether it be someone at the airport or someone in a village, that your Holy Spirit shines through her and that she is able to bless them out of the overflow of blessing that you have put into her life. We glorify your name, God. And I pray that Karis be an inspiration to all that she meets and especially the young people here in this church to open their hearts to the call that God may have on them. We thank you, Lord. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, amen.
good morning. If this is your first time, grab the Connect card in front of you and bring it to the information desk. We have a gift for you and we wanna connect with you. Tithes and offerings can be given in the back of the sanctuary. Online at odessafirst.com or in the Church Center app. Don't have the Church Center app? Download it today in your app store. And while you're there, add the Bible app to follow today's service. There's something for everyone at OFA. Here's a look at what's coming up. Be sure to follow us online at Odessa First AG. Let's settle in and get ready for whatever the Lord has for us today. I know I'm ready for what the Lord has for us today. How about you guys? Just a couple things, a few things that I want to highlight before we get started this morning. One is about a month ago, we kicked off the, the pantry pylon benefiting Pleasant Hills Children's Home. There's a table in the foyer. There's a paper with what all they need. Um, so within the last year, some super good friends of mine and Brittany's became house parents at, at Pleasant Hills. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I didn't think there was a, a, a need or that this was a great ministry before them becoming house parents, because I did. It's also ch children need Jesus. I, I can only reflect on my own life and, and how if somebody would have showed me more of the love of Christ when I was a child, how things may have played out a little different for me. But while they've been out there, I've had the opportunity to hear bits and pieces of stories of, of the, the children that are, are coming into this home. And um, if you're not familiar with what Pleasant Hills is, uh, it, it, it's a children's home for where children have been removed from their parents out of safety or parents are in jail or they're involved with drugs or, 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 or things like that. And... Um, I've heard stories from my friend that have made me cry in, in both ways and cried tears of joy for how God is touching these children and cried tears of sadness for the lives that some of these young people have lived before coming there. And uh, they need your help. They need to eat. And so th this is an AG ministry. These, th this is not just a foster care program where they're just stuck in some, in some people's house. Uh, these, these are all people who are uh, part of the same fellowship that we are. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're shining that love into these children. And so Pastor challenged us to make this a, a great year of support for the children's home. And so you can, Miss Kathy is not um, in here. She's helping in, in children's ministry, but Ben is her husband, and, and you can usually find them together uh, in, the, in the foyer. Kathy's taking the lead on that. If you're not able to, to, to purchase, like if you just don't feel like uh, adding to your grocery cart, um, you, you can give and, and we can do the shopping for you and make sure that they get the things that they need. But this, this is a great need and I really encourage you guys to, to take part in it. Um, also, if you notice on the screen, this Wednesday, we will not have a, a first Wednesday or family meal service. We're going to um, kind of push that off because of the 4th of July holiday. However, um, because we're not all sweating at the fireworks stand, uh, we're, we're going to have a, a fire, firecracker watch party. I had that idea last year, and we kind of threw it together last minute, and we had a great response. And so uh, July 4th, starting at around 8-ish, uh, we're going to meet up here and have some popcorn and some snacks and maybe a little acoustic worship or 
I don't know. We're going to hang out in fellowship. It's going to be a safe place. And we could sit in the south parking lot and watch the fireworks when they go off and not have to get all into the downtown mix. So, so come and join us for that. There's a lot of stuff going on this month. We've got both kids and youth camp, district council in Lubbock. Well, we're excited for what the Lord is doing. I uh, want to say hi to our friends in Big Lake. We are still ministering to the church in Big Lake. It's a trask are gone, and they're joining us online this morning. I've had the opportunity to go down a couple weeks on Wednesday and, and uh, lead them in Promise Principle, just like we're doing here on Wednesday nights. And, and they are wonderful, sweet people who I, I'm growing to love, and we're so grateful that they're joining us online today. All right, housekeeping out of the way. So today's message is called Unmasked, and I am super excited for this message. I normally, when, when I get the opportunity to, to, to share, um, I'm nervous. I'm, 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 I'm nervous. We, we have some really great leaders and, and men of God that that share and handle the gospel very well in, in Pastor Todd and, and Derek. And so I know Pastor Todd takes coming behind this podium very seriously, and so I'm usually pretty nervous. I want to do, I don't have uh, the time serving the Lord. I didn't go to, to seminary or, or all that stuff, and so I, I'm usually nervous. But man, I, I'm not nervous today. I'm excited because this is, this is a work that God started doing in me, and, and it's blessed me, it's blessed my marriage, it's blessed, it's, it's been really freeing. And so I've, I've been excited for the last week to, to get to share this with you because I, uh, I feel like it'll be a blessing to you. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 22, and we're going to be in Genesis. But before we get started, let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you that you have given us this church to be able to to gather and that regardless of the the miles or the distance that your word can be shared and we can minister the gospel. And Lord, I just pray that for the next few moments that it not be my words that your people hear, but that you give them ears to hear your word, Lord. Father, I pray that our hearts be good soil to receive what you have for us this morning and it return a harvest 30, 60, and even 100 fold in our lives. We pray all these things in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, I'm super glad that we have a row full of youth this morning because I'm going to open up with a story about a video game. So, there. One of my favorite. Just listen. If you're not a video game person, just track with me for for just a minute. I I sit in the back and I listen to all the hunting stories. And I'm not a hunter. So this morning we're going to talk about video games. Um, there there's this video game that come out uh, probably ten years ago. It's called Skyrim. It's a very popular video game, and, and just, just track with me, okay? And, and in the beginning, when you start the game, it's like first person, it's like you wake up, and you're this, this prisoner in a, a caravan full of prisoners, and you get to, you know, there, there's other prisoners talking, it gives you a little backstory, but you get to the, to the village, and there's a guard commander, and he's got a list, and, and he reads off these people's names who are on the caravan with you. And then he comes to you and he says, you're not on the list. Who are you? And that's, that's, that's where we're going with the Skyrim story this morning. Who are you? And see me, I know that I'm going to look through the eyes of this character the whole time. I'm not going to see him ever unless I push special buttons to, to make myself see him. So I don't spend a lot of time here. But there are people who spend hours 
making the face and the lips and the eyes and everything look just right and making, maybe making it look like them or maybe making it look like what they want to look like. Going through this process of, of creating the perfect character. And the reason I bring that up this morning, the reason I lead into our, our message with that is because I believe that outside of the video game world, many, possibly all of us, are guilty of trying to create the perfect character that other people see. That, that we're guilty of, of putting on this persona, this different person, because we want people to see us in a certain light. We want to be viewed a certain way. And so that's why we're going to talk about being unmasked this morning. And, and to talk about being unmasked, I think we first needed to define what a mask is. And so I, I looked up what a, I mean, most of us know. It's just real quick, just so I don't, nobody gets on to me. I'm not talking about, this morning, we are not talking about the medical mask that people wear to prevent sickness or anything like that. So if you uh, wear a mask, if you like that. <clears throat> but I looked up what a mask is. I looked at what a mask is. And so the definition of a mask is a covering for all or part of the face worn as a disguise. So that's like the, the, the Webster dictionary definition. But I also see this description of what a mask is. And, and I, I kind of like it a little better than I liked the uh, definition. It says a, a mask is a form of disguise or concealment usually worn over or in front of the face to hide the identity of a person and establish another being. To hide the identity of a person and establish another being. And so, so remember, that, remember that description as, as we go through uh, our, our message this morning. And so first, I, I, I want us to look at a couple of accounts in Scripture of people hiding their identity, people hiding their identity. And so let's go first to, to Luke 22. We're going to be starting in verse 54. I'm reading out of the ESV, but you read out of whatever version ministers to you. It will be on the screen. Uh, so starting at verse uh, 54, Luke 22, says, Then they seized him and led him away. And so for context, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is being arrested, and, and they're leading him away. Um, and they're bringing him into the, the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And so, and so just in case anybody, who's, who's Peter? Peter is one of Jesus' disciples. He's one of the main disciples in the crew. And so they're, they've arrested Jesus. They're taking him off, and Peter is kind of stalking back a little bit. What's going on? What, what's going to happen to my Lord? What, what's going to happen here? And so... Uh, they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard there in front of the high priest's house, and Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking at him closely, said, this man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Verse 59, after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. Jesus was from Galilee. They said, this man is from Galilee. Surely he would, they don't come around here a whole lot. Surely this man was with him. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, 
you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is the man, Peter is the man that, that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he says, hey, who are people saying that I am? And they all had these different answers of who, who the public was saying he is. And then he says, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. This is the man who the, the Holy Spirit influenced to call out who Jesus was. That he wasn't John the Baptist, he wasn't Elijah reincarnated, that he, he wasn't just another prophet that had came to Israel, that he was the coming Messiah that had been prophesied about. And, and Jesus said, I'll build my house upon you, that, you, that you're no longer, see his name was Simon, which meant pebble. He said, but now you're called Peter, which means rock. And I'll build my house upon the rock. That's who we're talking about here in Luke 22. This this is the guy who, when Jesus says, I have to go to the cross, that the, the son of man must be persecuted, that he must be beaten, that he must be tortured, that he must suffer. Peter said, oh, no, Lord. No, that's not happening. Not on my watch. Not gonna happen. When they came just moments earlier, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter whipped out his sword and cut a guy's ear off. Listen, Roman law, it, it was in the, check this, this is crazy. It was in the law that a Roman soldier could be having a bad day and see a Jewish man and walk over him. As long as he used the open hand. That's the kind of oppression that, that Peter and his brothers lived under. And Peter has whipped out the sword and cut this man's ear off. But now, in this moment of fear, Peter not only denies Christ, he, he denies even being a Galilean. He, he denies who, even who he is. We wear masks out of fear. We wear masks out of, out of fear. Peter put on a mask here out of fear. He was zealous for Christ. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you, if you remember this story, there's a story where Jesus, you know, he's got his 12 disciples, but he's got the three, right? We all have that. We've got a group of friends, but then you've got those one friends that that's like your close, your close group of friends. That's, that's Peter and John and James. And Jesus takes them up onto this mountain with him. And he reveals his glory and Moses and Elijah appear, and Peter's like, we need to build some tents. I don't know what's going on here. Like, this is awesome. Yet in a moment of fear, Peter puts on a mask that I'm just another person in the crowd, hiding the fact that he was a devout follower of Christ. Many of us today put on masks out of fear. We fear being seen as weak. We fear letting others get too close. We fear being exposed. Speaking of being exposed, let's look at another example of people covering up who they were for a different reason. Genesis chapter 2 Verse 25. It says, the man and his wife, God, God has created everything. He's made heaven. He's made earth. He's made the trees. He's made the fruit. He's made all of these things. And then he's made man and woman. And he's like, man, all this is, all this is good. And he's, he's kicked back and, and started resting. And, and here the author of, of Genesis says that the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. 
That's who they were. They were in the garden and they were naked and they were not ashamed. The author makes a point to end the creation story by highlighting. He, he could have said it was a beautiful day and all the, the, the fruit trees blossomed and bore much fruit. But he says, Adam and Eve were both naked and not afraid. Not ashamed, excuse me. Jump over to Genesis 3, starting in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and just backstory, they have been told, hey, all this is yours, don't eat from that tree. Don't eat from that. And a serpent has come along, and, and she's, he's tempted Eve. And so it says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. And she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Verse seven, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. We wear masks because of sin. We put on masks because we have sinned. A lot of times, myself included, when we teach the story of the fall, we put the emphasis on a little later in the chapter where it says that God showed up and he said, hey, where are you guys? And that they hid from God. And we say, oh, when we, when we sin, we hide. And that is absolutely true. But I want to point out that the moment that they sinned. It says they ate from the tree, verse 6, verse 7, they covered up who they were. They sinned and they cover up who they were. We wear masks to cover who we are. We, we don't want others to see what's really there. Maybe we don't like what's really there. Maybe we're ashamed. You know, verse, verse 25 in chapter 2 says, said that they were naked and not ashamed. And maybe that shame came in and they felt the need to, to cover up. They, they felt the need to, oh, no, 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 no. But God didn't create them loincloths. And he said it was good. But when they sinned, they felt that need to cover up who they are. Much like Adam and Eve trying to cover who they are or Peter's outburst, many of us use masks as self-defense mechanisms. Rejection, abuse, bullying, all these things can lead to us wanting to protect ourselves. Superheroes are even known for wearing a mask. Even with all their power, they still feel a need to cover who they are for protection. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to, to protect ourselves. I, I, I'm not telling you that at all this morning. We should definitely want to protect ourselves. Scripture tells us the importance of setting boundaries in our life. We want to keep ourselves from getting hurt, not just physically, but emotionally as well. Proverbs chapter 4 tells us, above all else, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows out of it. Scripture tells us to protect our heart, to protect that special, that special place. 
We absolutely should do that. But it doesn't tell us to hide who we are. You see, outside of bank robbers and trick-or-treaters, physical masks are not an everyday thing. We are far more likely to wear personality masks. A personality mask allows those who wear them to hide their real self from others. And these masks can serve as a barrier of protection for your self-esteem and from hurt. So I have a, have a, a list that we're going to run through very quickly of some personality masks. And the first mask is the martyr or the victim. This person blames others instead of accepting responsibility. We have the bully. This person uses bullying as a tactic to keep others at a distance. If I'm, if I'm mean to you, I can keep you away from me. We have the humor mask. People use humor. They, they joke around. They cut up. If I make you laugh with me, you're not laughing at me. Some people put on the calm mask. The whole world can be crashing down around them, and they bottle up those emotions so they just seem cool and level. When really under their surface, they're like a duck just kicking to stay afloat. Self-bashing. If I put myself down first, well, then you, you can't put me down because I already said it. The avoidant mask. This person withdraws from, from people and situations to avoid rejection or judgment. Some people wear the controlling mask. They try to control everything for a sense of security. If I, if I could tell everyone what to do and everything goes where I say it needs to go and everything is the way I think it needs to be and I'm in control, then I can't get hurt. We have the socializer, uh, people pleasing, excuse me, people pleasing. This person's self esteem depends on the acceptance of others. Then we have the socializer, many acquaintances, few friends. They, oh, I, I talk to a lot of people. I say, everybody I see out in the hallway, I say good morning to you and I shake their hand and I talk to them. But, and it looks like I'm a very friendly person, but no one really knows me. No one really knows who's on the inside. And then we have the conformist. This is similar to what Peter did. He just went with the flow to fit in. He said, oh, no, 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 I'm not a Galilean. I'm, I'm one of you guys. That's, that's not who I am. <clears throat> we wear a mask to protect ourselves. Well, I practiced tying this once before. I wear the overachiever mask. I never have too many projects. If you need somebody to get the job done, that's me. I got you. I I can take care of it. I'm never overwhelmed. I never fall short of success. I never struggle. I can do everything that needs to be done way before the deadline and with a standard of excellence with everything I do. 
I'm the, the perfect disciple. I'm the perfect employee. I'm the perfect husband. I'm the perfect father. I'm the perfect friend. And I can wear all of those hats at the same time and never get distracted, never burn out, and never miss a beat. I wear the overachiever mask. The truth is, I take on way more than I can accomplish. The truth is that if I feel like, that I feel like if a graphic doesn't look perfect, there's a hiccup on the live stream, that I'm the worst person possible to be in that booth. And they're probably actively looking for somebody to replace me. The truth is, not only do I get overwhelmed, but then I, I struggle. I wonder if I'm doing what God's called me to do. At the end of a long day, when things haven't been as perfect as I like to put on that they are at home, and I stop at stripes and I walk in and I see that row of ice cold tall cans at the back of the store, I think, man, those sure look good. And if I had one, I would feel better. The truth is I, I do struggle the truth is, I, I have had temptations and had sins in my life. And I'm scared that if I let you guys know, that none of you will like me. I need this mask so much that for the greater part of three years, I even wore this mask at home. Because if I couldn't be the, the perfect husband who could provide and cook and never got frustrated or, or never, never needed someone to lean on myself but could always be the person you could lean on, I was scared I wouldn't be enough for my wife. God knows who we are under the mask. Amen. Psalms 139 says, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Skip down to verse 13. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. <clears throat> my frame was not hid from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, 
the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. I've known, we, Brittany and I went to a marriage conference in, in Dallas last weekend, and I've known since the drive home that I was going to put this mask on, put a proverbial mask on to represent the mask that you guys have seen me wear since you've known me. I've known that's what the Lord has wanted me to do this morning. I really wish I could have skipped that part. It's hard. It's hard. Not necessarily to say who I am with the mask on. It's hard to take off the mask and say who's really underneath. really stuff that I struggle with. On our way to Dallas, Pastor Todd shot me a text message and he said, hey, when you get a moment, give me a call. And Brittany said, what do you think he wants to talk to you about? (laughs) And I said, the same thing I think every time he says he wants to talk to me, that he's had enough and I'm going to be excommunicated from the church. That's what I think every time. That's where, that's, where, that's where my mind goes. Every time that he says he wants to talk, I've told him this. He's, and, and Brittany said the same thing that he says to me. Brother, you need to get freedom from that. <laughs> I do it with her. Every time she says, hey, babe, we need to talk. This is it. The suitcase is by the door. <laughs> She's, I've, I've, I've left my trash laying around one too many times and she's out of here. It's not the truth. It's not the truth. And see, that's, that's the thing. That's the problem. See, remember I said earlier that there's nothing wrong with wanting to protect ourselves. And, and sometimes, if, especially if any of you have done any, any type of industrial work or, or think of a welder, Think of a well. I think all of us can picture a welder in our head. What what do welders need to be able to do their job? A mask. They have to wear a mask to protect themselves. Have any of you ever put on a welding mask? When you're not, when you're not welding, you can't see a thing. You can see the sun. If you want to watch an eclipse, you can, you can use a, you can use a, a, a welding mask. The, the, the point I'm trying to make here is sometimes masks can serve a purpose. Sometimes they can be okay for us to, to wear. But God knows who we are under the mask. The problem with wearing a mask is that they work. I put on that overachiever and man, I got a problem. I can just go to Tony. He can get it done. He can handle it. He can take care of it. And I always say, yep, I sure can. I got you. I'll do it. And what happens when I don this overachiever mask and I perform my role well, people like me. Well, they like the guy in the mask. And then I feel like they like the guy in the mask so much that they could never like the person underneath. And so I have to put on the mask again. 
And people like the guy in the mask. And so I just keep the mask on. And my wife likes me. You guys like me. My boss likes me. I don't disappoint people nearly as much. But I'm so sad inside because nobody knows me. Several times over the course of our marriage, Brittany has said, I feel like I don't know you. Why? Here I am. I'm doing, I'm doing all the stuff. I'm doing all the good things. I'm checking all the boxes. There's a mask there. Part of our, our weekend in Dallas at this marriage conference, <clears throat> we were separated and we had to identify our mask and, and not just say, I wear the overachiever mask, but we had to talk about it. We had, we had to really line it out and go through it. And, and during that time, there was a breakthrough. Because yes, absolutely, just like the welder, when he does his job, sometimes we got to put the mask on. We got we got to do it. But the Lord used a favorite movie of mine to reveal something to me. Anybody seen Batman with Christian Bale, the best Batman? If you don't think Christian Bale is the Batman, best Batman, at altar call, come stand over here and we'll <laughs> pray special for you. Just kidding, just kidding. In that movie, specifically the Christian Bale Batman, there's a scene where Batman has, has returned home, returned to the Batcave, returned to the mansion at the end of the day. And he's taking off the bat suit. And the man underneath is covered in bruises and scars. The bat suit looked perfectly fine. But the man underneath is beat up. And Alfred was there. And Alfred gets the first aid kit and says, you need to take better care of yourself while he's doctoring up these wounds. God knows who we are under the mask, but we all need at least one person, preferably multiple people, but at least one person who at the end of the day, we can take the mask off and that person can see the cuts, the scrapes, the bruises, the blemishes, the imperfections, and can come love on you and can come encourage who you really are. Alfred wasn't encouraging and loving on Batman. He was loving Bruce Wayne. He was loving the, the man underneath the, the mask. As we continue to wear our mask, we lose confidence in the real us and depend more and more on the mask because we want to keep others from seeing our flaws, our scars, and our brokenness. While I was getting ready for this sermon, I was doing some research and some looking, and I came across this Japanese 
pottery that I'm going to pronounce as Kintsugi. So it may be uh, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, you, whatever you want to say. It's called Kintsugi. And so they take these, this pottery that's been broken, and they use epoxy that's got gold and silver and platinum in it, and they put it back together. He's going to go through a few pictures of some different types. Maybe you've seen, like, on TV or something, a, a, or in a store, if you go to really good stores, some of these items that, and they're, they're beautiful. They look way better than the original bowl or vase did. And they're even more valuable than they were before because now it's not just clay. It's clay and gold or clay and silver or clay and platinum. And a second artisan, not the artisan who created the original piece, but a second person has come in and poured their skill into creating this beautiful creation. And, and some are more broken than others. And they're still able to, to fill it in. I want to encourage you this morning. God knows who you are under the mask. And if you'll let him, if, if you'll... Quit trying to put on a mask to him by his blood and through his Holy Spirit. He'll take all your broken pieces and he'll fill them and he'll form something more beautiful, more precious, and more valuable than it was without him. Amen. There's freedom in taking off the mask. In being who we really are. I've come to the realization now that I don't have to wear the mask at the house. And it turns out my wife really loves that guy who's underneath the mask. And I don't have to wear the mask as much here with you guys. And most of you guys, thanks Jimmy for the hard nod, that, that you guys will love me without the mask. During VBS, I wore a suit as the, the little mascot that we came up with, Emmett, the, the, the Lego man. Don't, don't tell. We'll tell that. A couple nights during VBS, two nights in a row, when I, when I came in, when, when Emmett came in, there's a young man who, in his excitement, came running up and clocked Emmett in the back of the head pretty solidly. <laughs> the second time, Miss Tanya seen him do that. And as I was praying this morning, this isn't even in my notes, just as I was praying this morning, I remember what she told him. She said, hey, there's a person under there. There's, there's a real... A, that's not a Lego man. There's a real person in there. 
It's a real person under the mask that we wear. There's somebody with feelings, somebody who, who can be hurt and doesn't want to be. And Christ went to the cross not because he loved the person with the mask on. He died for the person underneath. He died for the the sinner. He died for the person who falls short. He dies for the person who gets overwhelmed. He died for the person who gets tempted. He died for the person who can't do it without him. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians that one of his greatest revelations was that in his weakness, Christ's strength is made perfect. When we're broken and the pieces are scattered, Christ's love and Christ's strength can put them back together, make it stronger than it was before. If Christ can love that person that's under the mask, if he can love that person with the flaws and the scars and the hurts and the hang-ups, that we're called to be like Christ, then we can love that person too. I can love the person in the mirror because the person in the mirror was enough for Christ to die for. And you can love the person in the mirror because he died for that person too. And you can also love the other person when they take their mask off, when they show you who they really are, when you see them in the hallway and you smile real big and you say, hey, how's it going? And their shoulders drop a little bit because the answer isn't, good, how are you? You can love that person too. Will you stand with me this morning? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 16, it says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. See, we can turn to the Lord with that unveiled face and we can be made into a new 
image into the image of Christ. That gold, that precious blood of Jesus can be put into the cracks and the crevices. The Holy Spirit can be put into those places that are weak. And they can hold the brokenness together. I told you guys a minute ago that it wasn't easy to get up here to take off the mask and put myself out in the street like that. But it's freeing. I feel good. I feel good because y'all know it's on video now. Like I can't deny it anymore. So I, 